Welcome to the Gilbert House Fellowship, a virtual gathering of believers seeking to better understand the Word of God, with your hosts, Derek and Sharon Gilbert, and Sam T. Doxon. From the heart of the beautiful Missouri Ozarks, greetings and welcome to the Gilbert House Fellowship Old Testament Bible Study for Sunday, June 16th, 2019. I'm Derek Gilbert. I'm Sharon Gilbert, and can you see my little waveform on that uh, program there? Yes. Ah, that's good. Welcome to our... Oh, sorry about that. We'll snap there. (laughs) Welcome to our humble bunker, everybody. This is Sharon, of course, and uh, we are trying a new program. Normally, we use Audacity. Now, we're using Audacity. Right. This is the version, uh, the professional version of uh, something that we used, well, I used back in, um, gosh, 2006. (laughs) Yeah, 06 and 07 at... uh the, 1906. The radio That's what's really amazing about the whole thing. You were way ahead of the curve on uh, podcasting. Yeah, way ahead of Marconi and his Orthicon oh, tube. Yeah. yeah. No, this is uh, uh, a professional recording program. It's used by a lot of uh, uh, of audio professionals. Mm-hmm. We've been using the freeware version uh, for, of Audacity since we started podcasting in 2005. And last week, when we did our summary of our tour from Glastonbury to Glasgow, uh, from Gilgal Rephaim to the Golan Heights. Well, it's on the Golan Heights. Anyway, it's just from Israel the, to Inverness. Yes, uh, yes, there we go. There's a good alliteration. That uh, there were a lot of uh, dropped audio spots in the beginning. And it could be that the iMac was doing something in the background that caused it. But every week when we record on Audacity, there are some dropouts. It's just that normally they don't show up. You know, I'll go back and I'll listen and make sure, okay, it's not missing anything. Once prior to this, I had to do some editing. But last week, I really had to do major surgery on that uh, program. And, and so, honestly, it didn't sound like there was a problem at all by no, the time no. you were done. So you're a master at that. Well, but being anyway. as it's Father's Day, we didn't want to put you through that again. <laughs> so anyway, we're using the pro program, which... which Makes you wonder what's what's in there, sort of playing around with bits and bites. It, it kind of does. <laughs> Laughing with snotty glee. Yeah, yeah. Well, we we know they're probably trying to disenfranchise or deplatform or something. Uh, look, Whoever you know, they are. They are. Yeah, I, yeah. You know, the, the, here's the here's the hard truth. There are a lot of folks who are Christian ministry in mm-hmm. Christian ministry online, and and uh, their platforms are being reduced by providers and reused and recycled. Well. Yeah. <laughs> They're they're being shadow banned. I mean, that's what it really comes down to. That is a fact, yes. Derek and I have talked about this. We have a lot of friends who are going through that. Uh, Praise God so far. We've not noticed a whole lot with our stuff, but, you know, it's probably going to come eventually. Our, uh, our, Our viewpoint is this. We throw the seed out there the best we can. Mm hmm You know, the Lord's Word. And, uh, we do our best to, uh, well, to to explain his word and to dive into his word, to to exegete correctly. Right. <clears throat> Excuse me, but uh, we're not perfect at it. No. But we believe that that seed is going to flower and produce fruit according to his will. Therefore, right. if there's only right. one person in the entire world who is supposed to hear it, he or she will. Absolutely, and it makes and that makes the effort worthwhile. Exactly. And you know, praise God, we're not dependent on. Um, doing this for our daily bread. No, but, and, uh, you know, here's the thing. The Lord gives us so much bread sometimes right, that we're right. overwhelmed with uh, what do we do with it. But we have found every <laughs> yes. time the Lord sort of gives us far more than we ever need, mm-hmm. we never go, hey, let's spend this on, you know, fill in the blank. We have learned over the years, and, right. you know, the Lord gives it to us because we're storing it up for somebody else. Somebody else needs it, right? Um, and that is why, why we've got some pretty good electronic toys. Let's not, we do. No, to be perfectly honest here. The Lord's but, given us great toys. Yes. Thank but, you, Father. Um, the house is modest. Our two vehicles between the two of them have about three hundred and thirty thousand miles on them, so mm-hmm. it's not. But like, they're going well. They're they're right, in right, great right. shape, and so you know, it's it's not like we're going out and we're we're spending on that, um, but. Yes, as you say, we, we found that uh, we've got some extra. Okay, I mean, let's just put that in the bank and wait and see what happens. And then sure enough, somebody we know turns up with a need. So that's and, and we're grateful. That, we are uh, so, so grateful that the Lord does that. You know, we see it as nothing more than passing ammunition. Sure. Because, you know, it, it's like the old saying, if not us, then who? Uh, exactly. So exactly. Any, anyway. So there you have that. But uh we get back into his word today, which makes me so, so very happy. Last yeah. week, if you listened to our Gilbert House Fellowship return to the mics, uh, we blathered a lot. 
imagine us. I don't know. We don't like to talk, and we don't. Yeah. So it was it was like pulling teeth to get get us to put words out there. Yeah, yeah. But uh, thankfully, uh, the, the Lord uh, kind of gave us grace sufficient for the day, and so here we are back <laughs> again. But we are excited to be back in in um, the Word again because we started this almost five years ago. Um, in response to people who'd come up to us at conferences saying, where do we find a good church? Now, we never started this with the intention of making this a substitute for church. No. And in fact, got an email from, about this just last week, somebody who had just found us. Um, we, we don't do this live uh, just because the bandwidth here in our country internet service is not robust enough to guarantee that we could always do it and, and be there live every week. No, uh, we can't. When Derek does a VFT be live on uh, Sunday nights, which will uh, begin again Live ne- next week. Next week. Got another best of tonight. Yeah. yeah. Well, your best ofs are awesome. Well, and you, uh, you know, it's blessed. Father's Day. You shouldn't have to go back on the mic live tonight. <laughs> but but we use our phone connection. We've mm-hmm. got a pretty darn good phone connection because there's a cell tower right across the road from us. Right, right. And uh, so we get a, a great signal there. And we have, the Lord has allowed us to be able to afford a plan on our phone, a uh, personal hotspot connection. That is enough that you can do your thing once a month. Right. But uh, sorry, once a week. But we can't do a whole lot more than that because yeah. we start getting throttled. Yeah. So that uh, th- that's why we don't do it this live. I, I, and the other thing too is that uh, when we're talking about the, the Word of God, there are times that um, w- as a backstop or as a safety valve, if, if we say something and then realize later we misspoke, we can go back and edit mm-hmm. before we put it out there because yeah. we don't we don't want to be wrong. I mean, we will speculate on things. And we're not going to be perfect regardless. But if we say something that we know is wrong, we want to go back and cut it out before mm-hmm. it uh, goes out there. So cut it out exactly. So that's that's why uh, we don't do this live. But again, the point is not to replace church, but to supplement and um, just go through the word and to also d- demonstrate that you don't need to be a PhD to really dig into the Bible and get more out of it. Yeah. And uh, it really helps to read it out loud. And the two of us being able to do this, uh, is, it's the same. Th- it, you you have the same ability. If, if you're blessed with family members close by, husband, wife, uh, children, whatever, uh, even friends, you can gather together and do the same thing mm-hmm. and get the same kind of benefit With the added benefit, of course, having that fellowship of being with other believers. Yes, and I'm going to connect that to the book of Revelation because there's a promise there to those who hear the word. Mm -hmm. And hearing is more than just it hits your tympanic membrane. It means it actually goes into your head. But, But to me, that that speaks of something powerful about the spoken word, God's spoken word, not just reading it inside your head to yourself but hearing it spoken aloud. Mm -hmm. So you can do this with your families at home, dads and moms, grandmas and grandpas. You can do this. Even have your children read it aloud. Sure, sure. There's something so amazing, and and you will find that you see things in this that you never caught Mm -hmm. reading it silently to yourself. Yeah, there's something about running it through the whatever channels in your mind, your your brain, uh, that that have to be engaged in order to get the words spoken out and spoken mm-hmm. that that engages parts of your brain that uh, can be bypassed i think mm-hmm. when you're reading to yourself and yeah. as i've said before there are p- places in the bible when you get into um say leviticus and deuteronomy and some of the begats that you know get kind of boring but even but there when you're reading it out loud you begin to realize wait a minute wait a minute there's more here than what i thought and i was skipping over some some stuff that's really good yeah there's nothing in god's word that isn't important it's all it, there's no filler there is no yeah. filler. Well, we're going to begin with the meat, because if you don't get Genesis and Revelation, you have nothing to hold exactly. your Bible together. <laughs> exactly. There's no foundation and there's no roof. Um, but the fo- Genesis is the foundation, mm-hmm. because if there's no fall from grace, if there's no fall from a state uh, that was part of God's original design, then there's no need for a, a savior. No there's need nothing for to restoration. be saved from. No, yeah, if, no need for redemption. If nothing. sin and death have been in the world since the very beginning, and we are just a product of billions of years plus random chance, then God's decision to punish us for committing sin mm-hmm. is really arbitrary and unfair. Exactly. You may as well just have a Bible that's written by a whole bunch of monkeys sitting for a hundred years yeah. and had a typewriter. And then if you're going to find somebody to worship, it might as well be a, a, a life coach. Because that's that's what the Bible's reduced that, to. That's what many churches have reduced yes. our Lord to is uh, Jesus is our life coach. That that is that is sad. Yeah. Well, yeah. shall we dig in? Let's open with Let's a word have, of prayer. Okay. 
Father, we thank you for making it possible for us to be here today, regardless of where we are or uh, whatever our, our situation is in life. We are grateful, Father, to, that you've brought us together through this, this virtual fellowship. We pray, Father, that your Holy Spirit will open our eyes, our hearts, and our minds to the truth of your word. Grant us wisdom, Lord. Grant us understanding and discernment that we'd rightly divide your word. Understand it properly, knowing that we won't understand everything because not everything has been revealed yet. But help us, Lord, as we do read and and hear your word, that you will help us to add nothing to it and take nothing away from it. Open our eyes, Father, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen, indeed. Well, I think we'll get about one verse in before we stop to blather here. Uh, (laughs) I was going to say, I'm not even getting past the first three words. There is a lot to unpack. Um, Most, by the way, Jews and Christians believe the book of Genesis to be written by Moses. And we accept that. Mm -hmm. Um, We accept that there may be some later um, additions, perhaps, by by later uh, 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 editors along the way. Mm -hmm. But nothing that changes the substance of the... uh, the God. Bible, and I'm thinking in particular when we get later in, where um, that say, for example, the chiefs of Edom mm-hmm. are, are are listed later in Genesis, and those would have been after Moses' death. So clearly, those were added by somebody mm-hmm. later. Yeah, but it you doesn't. Do that. Yeah, doesn't change the truth that is in here. Right. Holy Spirit involved in all the steps. Exactly. Um, by the way, in case you are wondering, we read from the ESV, the English Standard Version. Mm-hmm. And I personally use blueletterbible.org. I like that website. It's easy to navigate. And you can dig into the Strong's, which is a really great place to Mm -hmm. start if you're trying to find the original meanings of the Aramaic, Hebrew, and uh, Greek original languages. Also, um, we do this in chronological order. Right, right. That's important to mention because we'll get through the first three chapters of Genesis and then we skip to Job. Mm-hmm. Because Job chronologically follows after about Genesis, uh, Ge- uh, Genesis three mm-hmm. uh, or or five. I think five, we did something it after like five or six. Yeah, last maybe time. I think Genesis six. You're right. It's before we get to the story of uh, Abraham. It'll take us three weeks to get to Genesis six at at our normal pace. Yeah, and by then, well, but yeah, by the time we get, I think we'll have our conference at in Branson before we get to Abraham. So. <laughs> If I looked at the schedule, the schedule, by the way, is posted at uh, gilberthouse.org. And uh, we also have a list of the chronological uh, order in which we read the Bible uh, posted there as well. So you can kind of look ahead and see. I try to put it on a calendar of upcoming events, but that changes week to week as we uh, read fewer chapters mm-hmm. than we had planned, which often happens. But um, that that will give you an idea of why we do what we do. And you'll find as we get into... Um, It'll follow pretty much a logical order until we get to the time of David, and uh, then we will skip back and forth between uh, First and Second Samuel and the Chronicles and the Kings, back and forth to that into um, Psalms, mm. because David wrote so many of the Psalms, so, and, and the same with the Solomon and the Proverbs. So, uh, but that's why we do it. It gives you a really good understanding of why what David was feeling when he wrote certain Psalms and so mm-hmm. forth. Amen. So, all right, Genesis one one. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Okay. In the beginning, Reshaith, God, Elohim, created bara, the heavens, Shamayim, and the earth, Eretz. Mm-hmm. So w- this first word, in the beginning, it- it's a word, sh- Reshaith, that means the chief of something or the head of something. Mm-hmm. In this case, it is the chief or the best of or the beginning of time. Mm-hmm. Um, I think time itself is a very, very interesting concept. Um, if all time, as we understand it, began with that first creative breath, mm-hmm. because he speaks things into being, uh, the word created here um, means to shape or create, um, to fashion, but we see later that he spoke everything into being. And we get later on, is it in the Psalms that we t- that it talks about when the morning star is sent, or is it Isaiah? Job. Uh, it's Job. Yes, you're right. And we'll get to that uh, well, in sometime. just a few weeks, so, yeah. hopefully. Um, yes, when the morning stars sang together. So you could make the case that the unfallen realm, the divine council, participated in this. And the way I write it in the Red Wing Saga is that they echo what they hear. Mm-hmm. So it's like a chorus behind the Lord who is the soloist. 
the Lord yeah. who wasn't alone, the second power was part of this creative right, right. event. As John writes, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Exactly. And if yeah. you want to say that, when God speaks, the power itself is in the Word. Mm-hmm. So that's the creative act. So Jesus himself not only holds all things together, he created everything mm-hmm. by being the living Word. So this, uh, this, this is an incredible moment. And we get to verse 2, which there may be some time maybe even lots of time between 1 and 2. We're in Genesis 1, 1 and 1, 2. You want to read uh, 1, 2? Well, I, I wanted to add a little well, more. Carry on. Because we'll just spend our whole time in this verse because well, it's an amazing one. We might. We might. Um, because w- one of the reasons we're excited about coming back to it is now having been through the Bible and having done more study over the last five years, we've got more of a... a more understanding, we're certainly not expert, but more understanding of the divine council concept and the cosmology of the cosmologies of the uh, pagan nations around ancient Israel mm-hmm. and where they may have gotten some of these concepts. The Bible gives us the the true story. Yes. Uh, the, it, it had been filtered through the fallen realm prior mm, to Moses writing this. Right, which is why the older Mesopotamian texts, the older Amorite texts, the older Akkadian texts, Hurrian and Hittite texts have very similar stories, but they're, they're portrayed differently. It's getting the same story, but filtered, as you said, through the fallen realm, getting a different worldview. So it's interesting, and this is something I had not seen when we read this five years ago. Heaven is, of course, an entity in the pagan realm. Yes. A god. Yes. One, Uranus. Yes. Uranus to the Greeks, An or Anu to the mm-hmm. Sumerians, uh, also Shemayim in, uh, in Akkadian. Well, in that is the very fact, word used here. Yes, right. And... There is a deity that is uh, known from uh, ancient Palmyra. You remember the the flap uh, over the last two years about the uh, the triumphal arch from Palmyra that yes. leads to the temple of Baal. The the temple, one of the temples that was destroyed by the Islamic State there in Palmyra, was a temple of Baal Shemim, Baal Shemayim, mm-hmm. Lord of the Heavens, mm-hmm. which was just another version or incarnation of this sky god. This, as you say, in Greek is equivalent to Uranus, and, and we see this, this pattern in, in the cosmologies of the ancient realm. From Sumer to Greece and Rome, you've got a primordial deity, or deities, actually a pair, because heaven and earth, Gaia in mm-hmm, Greek, mm-hmm. or in the uh, Sumerian, either Urash or Ki, mm. as in en Ki, Lord key, of Lord the Earth. Of the earth. Right. Exactly. Heaven and earth, a sort of a, a primordial um cosmic uh, pair. Sometimes referred to as Father Sky and Mother Earth. Exactly right. And of course, in the Greek myth, the they, they were the uh, parents of the first generation of uh, anthropomorphic gods, mm-hmm. like the, were the Titans, and then also some monstrous deities as well, the Hundred Handers and the Cyclopes and, and so forth. Um, but here in the Bible, we see that God, Yahweh, pre-existing all of these and creating these Mm -hmm. skeptics and atheists will look at the Hebrew Bible and somehow conclude that the Hebrews copied their religion from the ancient Mesopotamians. But the key difference is that Yahweh pre-existed all of these things and created them. Exactly. Alone. He has no beginning. He has no creator. Alone among the religions of the ancient world, the Hebrews worshiped a God who was not created. He was the creator and pre That is a fundamental inescapable difference that is uh that sets apart the god of the bible the god yes from all of the small g created beings who represented themselves to the pagans of the ancient world as heaven earth sky storm venus Mm -hmm. war plague pestilence yeah wolverine Exactly. Uh, so uh, anyway, that that is one of these things that uh, needed to be point at, pointed out here. That from the very first line of the Bible, the small g gods are there. Now remember that this doesn't mean that the the heaven really is a deity in its own right. No, there was a a supernatural entity that represented itself 
to the ancient world. It lied. It lied. Yes. Or, or because this was uh, the pattern that we see from Sumer to ancient Rome, that the older uh, generation, sky and earth, heaven and earth, uh, uh, Uranus and Gaia, uh, Calus and the Roman, and uh, I forget what the word for earth is in, uh, uh, in the Roman myth, but anyway, uh, they, they were replaced by the second generation, the Titans. Saturn to the Romans, Kronos to the Greeks. In uh, Sumer, the Akkadian myth, it was uh, Enlil. Mm-hmm. And in fact, I'm just writing the chapter now, and I wrote this in Last mm-hmm. Clash of the Titans, how Enlil and El of the Canaanites was the same entity as Kronos, Saturn, also called Baal, Haman by mm-hmm. the Phoenicians, Dagon to the Amorites. And I the know, I'm going to stop you because folks are listening and they're, they're, yeah, they're heads just exploding. going, too many names, can't keep track of them. Sure. Just buy Last Clash of the Titans. Get into one of the deals from SkywatchTVStore.com because yeah. uh, this is – and also I'd get the Great Inception also because this idea of the Divine Council – and mm-hmm. we, we this is our Mike Heiser moment. Ding, 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 ding. Because Michael S. Heiser, mm-hmm. Dr. Heiser, is the one that we – Always right, go right. back to this is something he explained to us, and his book Unseen Realm has to be foundational Absolutely. in your library. Yeah, all all of the stuff that I've been doing and that we're doing now with uh, uh, profiling the dead is based on Mike's work. We're just looking at how the divine council concept applies in Scripture, and here it is, right here: heaven and earth in mm-hmm. verse one. Uh, again, the second generation being the uh, the elder gods mm-hmm. like the the Titans, and then the third generation. Or, or second generation of anthropomorphic or humanoid type gods, the storm god Baal emerges as the king of the pantheon. Baal, Amen. Zeus, Jupiter. Amen. And this is so different from the fallen realms, you know, twisted version of the creation story. Mm-hmm. Because as you say, they began with, well, it all begins with heaven, entity, and, and earth, right. another entity. No, no. In the beginning, God, god created them. Exactly. And now, again, he is, didn't create an entity named heaven and an entity named earth. He created everything. Mm-hmm. I believe when it says he created the heavens and the earth, that means what we understand now is the heavens and the earth, and that includes the, the stars and everything up there, the, the many heavens that, that uh, Paul writes about. He created everything, and that includes the divine council. Right, right. And everyone in it. The stars that sang for joy on yes, the first day. Right? exactly. But then something happened. Mm-hmm. I'm a big believer in the gap theory. I believe something did happen because in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Full stop. Mm-hmm. That's the story. But then. Verse two. Verse two. You want to go ahead and read yeah. that? The earth was without form and void and darkness was over the face of the deep. And the spirit of God was hovering over the face of the waters. The original language does not have was in it. It's Mm -hmm. the earth formless. Um, The Hmm. word here Mm -hmm. is tohu. Yeah, tohu and bohu. The earth emptiness, the earth confusion, the earth formlessness. Was is implied, but the fact is it could just as easily, according to many who believe in this theory, and I'm not, I'm talking about genuine Hebrew, you know, um, ancient Hebrew scholars who believe that it, just as well could be became. In fact, became makes so much more Mm. sense because he would not have created heavens and earth formless. Yeah. Hmm. You're right. It, uh, well, and and that, that speaks to, um, the Hebrew word translated as deep darkness over the face of the deep. The Hebrew Mm -hmm. word is to home. And uh, that is very similar to Akkadian words tamtu or temtum, which is a cognate, which means same word, different language, from the ancient Sumerian word tiamat, Mm -hmm. which is the name of the chaos dragon or chaos monster, which is represented by the sea. And we see that representation all throughout the Bible, also called Leviathan or Rahab and other places. Mm -hmm. Um, This is a a word that is found in the religions of of some of the other pagan cultures around ancient Israel, like Ugaritic, mm-hmm. uh, to home, meaning the term for the primeval abyss. Yes. And I think that, I think you're on the right track there because the word Kosek, uh, um, which is translated darkness, has also been translated as prison. Hmm. Okay. Um, it seems to me that something happened between one, one and one, two that was a war. 
And it could be that the first divine realm, uh, the divine council had members within it that said, I don't like the way you're running things. Mm -hmm. I can run it better. Uh, Let's get out of here, form our own. And the result was that they were imprisoned. Yeah. And this is reflected in pagan mythology from uh, not not just Greek. I mean, we're familiar with the Greek myth of the Titans, the rebellion of the Titans, and then the uh, rebellion against Kronos and the Titans by Zeus and the Olympians. And then the Titans, the angels that sinned, according to Peter, Mm -hmm. uh, confined to the abyss. We know from the Bible, from Peter and Jude, that uh, there are angels who sinned, and their sin, according, when you read 2 Peter or Jude, you you get the context, you understand that it's a sexual sin, and we'll deal with that when we get to Genesis 6, but uh, they were confined to the abyss. But there's also a myth in Greek, uh, uh, among the Greeks and the Egyptians, well, in fact, all of the ancient Near East, of a battle between a warrior deity, a warrior god, and um, chaos. Yes. Tiamat, Leviathan, uh, Lotan. Mm-hmm. In uh, Egyptian, it's... Um, That's an old, old story, and it's repeated in myths that it even gets into Arthur and, and in Great Britain, this idea of defeating right. a dragon, a chaos right. monster. Thor did the same. There was mm-hmm. a dragon in, in the Hurrian and Hittite mythology of uh, uh, Teshub, their, their storm god. He had to do battle with a... Mm-hmm. Uh, a chaos dragon called Ilyanka or mm-hmm. something like that. So this is a consistent myth uh, where a warrior god, usually having to uh, get help from another deity, uh, in the case of Baal defeating the the, uh, the sea or Yam, he had to get special clubs made by the craftsman god Kothar Wahasis. Mm-hmm. But here, uniquely, uh, and when you read elsewhere in you know Isaiah where he crushes the heads of Leviathan um, and, and gives its body for food to those in the wilderness. Y- Yahweh didn't need help. No. Yahweh defeated the chaos monster. He didn't need a hammer, he didn't need anything, right. didn't need clubs, didn't right. need, yeah, just spoke it and you're S- done. And he sent his spirit as sort of a seal mm-hmm. hovering over this abyss. Right. Over, hovering over the face of the waters. But as in Greek mythology, where Kronos still, and Saturn in the Roman uh, myths, still worshipped even though they were confined to the netherworld. This spirit of chaos still has an influence on the world today. It's not until Revelation 21, where the sea is no more, that this chaos is completely and utterly destroyed. But also in Revelation, we see a monster, a beast rising up out of the sea out of as the if sea. it's as if the Holy Spirit has moved out of the way. Released from the abyss, right? Yes. 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 So you see the whole book ties together from Genesis to Revelation. It really does. Yeah. And mind you, note the darkness again is 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 here. This idea that darkness not only is a prison, but it, it reveals the aspect of that prison. Mm-hmm. Uh, we get created the heavens and the earth in one, which implies stars and, and a moon and a sun and all sorts of light. But then suddenly we have darkness. Right, right. This darkness is um, before God has separated day from night. Yes. So this is a different kind of darkness. This is a different kind of darkness. So in verse 3, we get God's response after the rebellion has been put down. Again, this is, I know it's... It's somewhat speculative, but there is right. there there are a lot of scholars who believe this. Yeah, and and by saying a lot of scholars, we uh, yeah full disclosure conf- confess that there are uh, many scholars who disagree. Exactly, who, who there don't are believe. those. Well, they're yeah. free to disagree, but sure. but it seems to me that it taken in context with the entire Bible and the yes. entire war, and also looking at the imitation versions of this story, the right, fallen realms right. twisted versions of this story. That it makes sense. Yeah, and speaking of this uh, warrior god versus a uh, chaos monster, there is a, 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 oh gosh, it's an inscription, a piece of art that's found dated to about the 26th century BC that depicts the uh, Sumerian warrior god Ninurta defeating a seven-headed dragon. Yes, that seven-headed dragon appears over and over yeah, throughout mythology. Yeah. And of course, I believe that is what we see in the book of Revelation. Amen. Amen. So yeah, anyway, that's that's our interpretation of this, uh, trying to look at this in context, not just of the Bible, but what the other pagan nations erroneously believed about mm-hmm. uh, the, pan- about the, uh, the, the, the universe. Uh, verse three, and God said, let there be light. And there was light. And God saw that the light was good, and God separated the light from the darkness. You know, I love that because we have darkness appearing in verse 2. Then God's response is, let there be light. Mm -hmm. He speaks it, and light appears. And he saw that it was good. Mm -hmm. Um, And then he separated the light from 
Kosek from mm-hmm. the darkness. Right. As if he is literally separating evil from good. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And verse five, God called the light day and the darkness he called night. And there was evening and there was morning the first day. Now, Mind interestingly, you, I just really want to quickly that their their night is a deity. So is day. Yes. So again, this is God's true version. Mm-hmm. Here's the real story based on what the uh, the Sumerians on up have said was the truth. Mm-hmm. Pre-flood, I'm sure that these same lies were being spun. That uh, Yom, the day, and uh, Lail, the night. Mm-hmm. Um, gosh, it would be Nix and uh, what was the daytime called in mm. uh, Greek? I would have to look. But these are entities. Mm-hmm. And... Uh, um, to separate them, you have to ask yourself if indeed there was a claim that there were entities <laughs> involved with what we just consider a- aspects of the day mm-hmm. of, of a 24 hour clock, what really happened? Yeah. Yeah. Was this sort of a Jekyll and Hyde separation, too? <laughs> well, I don't know because but, we see that many things that are done by the occult are done in darkness. True. So true. darkness is a friend to evil. But interestingly, of course, yes, light is is used in a very positive sense most of the way through the Bible. And there are a few occasions where day, uh, and this may not be one of them right here in Genesis 1, but where day is personified. It is addressed or referred to as an entity. Mm-hmm. But in Mesopotamian cosmology, Mesopotamian religion, day occurs as a demonic power, mm-hmm. a malevolent being that causes evil. Hmm. In, um, That's really interesting. A, a Sumerian psalm from the cult of Tammuz, or what they call Dumuzi in, in Sumerian. Uh-huh. A mother cries out on the death of her boy, Woe, day destroyed him and lost me a son. Oh, that's really interesting. So, Again, yes. we're not saying that that's what the word is saying. No. We're talking about comparing God's true account mm-hmm. here in Genesis with the f- fake news Coming right. from the fallen realm. Right. So it is um, just reinforcing the point that all of these small g entities or any entity representing itself as the god of day, night, storms, war. Snacks. Flowers. Yeah, snacks, whatever. Um, god Yahweh created them all. Yeah. And that is the key point. I love it too in Genesis 1-3. Th- and God said, let there be light. I think you could make a case at that point. He'd created the heavens and the earth. There was a rebellion. But there's no mention in there that time existed. Hmm. Okay. It's possible it did. It's entirely possible it did. But I'd say at the very least in one three we see the beginning of what we know as time. Yeah, and that's an interesting concept that you're going to explore in the Red Wing saga. Mm-hmm. Because God, we know, exists outside of time. He knows the end from the beginning. Exactly. Well, in the Red Wing saga, I've already sort of hinted at timey-wimey stuff. Mm-hmm. Uh, but in book uh, seven, which is called King's Gambit, uh, we get into a time maze. Mm, okay. Imagine being in the Stone Realms, if you've read uh, the uh, Realms of Stone. But it's not you know, necessarily going through physical doors as it is going through time doors. That would be really... Confusing. Diffi- yeah, difficult to even conceive of. Yeah. Because we're, we're created to experience time in a linear fashion. We are, but I have this theory that if I can think of it, mm-hmm. then somewhere in uh, God's realm, there exists that possibility. Now, does it mean that we as human beings can access that quote-unquote possibility? Mm-hmm. No, I think the Lord has closed a lot of doors. Right. To... Right possibilities. Um, The problem is that there are magicians like Aleister Crowley, and I mention him because Derek and I are doing research on Crowley right now, uh, that want to open those closed doors. There's a reason why we're commanded not to do that. Exactly. We we don't have the discernment. No, to, and yet to realize, to understand, to to know, recognize when we're being lied to. Exactly, yeah. and yet scientists at CERN and other places mm-hmm. they want to find all of these miraculous, you know, subparticles and and uh, figure out exactly how uh, they're really looking to see how time works. Mm-hmm. There's some who are advocating the use of certain um, mind altering, perception altering drugs to do the same thing. Mm. 
Yes, yeah. ayahuasca is yes. being purported as DMT, it's medicinal. Right. Mm-hmm. So let there be light, and Ch- there was light. And there was evening, and there was morning the first day. Verse 6, And God said, Let there be an expanse in the midst of the waters, and let it separate the waters from the waters. Okay, stop, because suddenly we've got waters, 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 and dry land appears out of it. So mm-hmm. what does this tell us? That the spirit hovering over the face of the waters in verse 2 means that there's no dry land. Right, right. The earth is just a big ball of water. Mm-hmm. Not flat. It is a big ball of water. Right, and... Uh, there are those who will look at verse 6 and look at the Hebrew word there, uh, rakia, which refers to a dome-like structure that uh, was believed by the ancient Israelites and the ancient Mesopotamians to separate the sky from the heavens. Mm-hmm. And uh, that does not mean that the earth literally has a dome over it like no. we're inside of a snow globe. No, we're not. That was their understanding. God, in his wisdom, when he called Moses to him in the 15th century BC, Did, didn't tell him, okay, first, before we can get into all this important stuff about what's good and what's bad, what's moral and what's immoral, I need to educate you on astrophysics. No, first. in order for the Lord to actually explain it to the extent that he understands it, right. well, by definition, Moses would have to become God, and that, right, sorry, right. that isn't going to happen. But we try to understand it with our limited you know, capabilities. Mm-hmm. You know, there are a lot of men and women on this earth that are very intelligent. However, we are limited by our space-time continuum and the number of dimensions we are capable of seeing. We have been, well, frankly, we've been dumbed down since the fall. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah, I'm, I'm just astounded in looking at what scholars, even 100 years ago, we're able to know. We, we today think that we've got a lot of knowledge because we've got access to the internet mm-hmm. and because I can take my phone and, you know, Google something. <gasps> that doesn't mean you actually know what you're Googling. It means you've got like a bunch of virtual yellow sticky notes all over yourself. With, <laughs> What's the capital of I Armenia? So and you get a little yellow stick. Yeah. It's like in Chicago, there's a kid show host named Ray Rayner who used to do that. He used to have little notes pinned to himself to remind himself, oh, it's time for a commercial or whatever. Um, <laughs> It's sort of like that. We don't actually possess knowledge anymore. We, and that's something that really astonished me. Well, not astonished me, but it just, it really it gets impressed on you when you see some of the things that we've been blessed to see over the last month. When you see the big structures in Jerusalem, you see the, the size of the stones that were moved into place when Herod expanded the platform for the Temple Mount. Uh, the churches that we saw, the, uh, the cathedral, Mm-hmm. In Canterbury, mm-hmm. uh, the older Glastonbury Abbey. And, and you look at people who were building these magnificent stone structures a thousand years ago without the benefit of computers, mm-hmm. without the benefit of slide rules, <laughs> basically doing it with paper and uh, quill or whatever. Oh, yes. Well, even uh, taking a look at, we watched a, doc- a documentary yesterday that included, what is it called? North Grange or that, that place um, in Ireland? New Grange. New Grange. Mm-hmm. That was built 500 years before the pyramids, Mm -hmm. and yet it is beautifully built. Yeah. Now, it has been slightly reconstructed, but the the original foundation, the design, they all hold up to modern-day building codes, Mm -hmm. you might say. In fact, it was uh, mentioned in the documentary that the roof hasn't leaked in, you know, like 5,000 years, I don't know, 3,000 years. Yeah. So... How did they do that? Well, because they actually had to learn stuff. Uh, I, gosh, what was I hearing the, the other day that uh, in order to become a student of one of the great uh, of Pythagoras, you oh had, yes, yes, you, Daniel did, was telling us that. Yeah, you had to be a uh, had to be a wrestler, had to understand mathematics, had to be a musician, had to be a musician, right. um, had to I don't know there there were like five or six requirements before right. he, he wanted would, you to be a well rounded person before he even took you on to study. Yeah, you know nowadays. We're, well, anyway, we won't go down that road. But you're right. We 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 aren't as intelligent. We love snowflakes. Come on in. <laughs> yeah, we, we love snowflakes. You. Yeah. <laughs> so anyway, yeah. Uh, yeah we, there are things that we uh, knew how to do years ago, and I, I've joked about this with uh, uh, fellows I used to work with because uh, I, I used to call on on Amish. Um, metal fabricators, mm-hmm. steel fabricators back in Illinois, that uh, if and when things really hit the fan and the grid goes down, we're all going to wish we knew what Amish, the Amish still know. Oh, I know. The Just Amish are going to have to suddenly skills, right? become a little bit defensive. Yeah, yeah, because we, we are depending on technology that uh, may not always be with us. Anyway, um, 
So, so we've even, got a, we've even, got a, even more so five or six thousand years ago. Yeah. Amen. Well, we've got a globe at this point in one six that is covered with water, mm-hmm. and this is really important. Again, getting into the Book of Revelation and the promise there that one day there will be no more sea. Yeah, yeah. And now it's just nothing but sea. Mm-hmm. And interestingly, in Revelation, that separated out from the creation of the new heaven and the new earth. You'd assume that if the old heaven and old earth had passed away, that the sea would have been part of that, but it's it's mentioned separately, and the sea was no more. Mm -hmm. And again, you know, it's not explicit, but we're trying to read between the lines here and interpret the sense that the sea representing chaos, representing this chaos monster, Mm -hmm. Tahom, Tiamat, Leviathan, Rahab, that, that chaos, that spirit of entity of chaos will be the final... To, uh, the final enemy of God that's destroyed in Revelation, just as the very first one encountered and confronted by Yahweh in the Bible. And you know what? We we were on Loch Ness, and <laughs> we saw nothing of Nessie. I don't know if Nessie is related to Leviathan. There, there's no genetic, you know... Actually, there's no genetic analysis of Nessie. Yeah. There claims to be one, but I'm not so sure about the... Uh, the results there. Yeah, the Nessie Hunter. Yeah, uh, God long bless story him. there. But yeah. anyway, that this is a globe covered with water, covered with the Holy Spirit, you know, who is protecting mm-hmm. whatever is below that has been jailed. And the Lord is, he is remaking what he original may, orig- mm-hmm. originally created in Genesis 1-1. Mm-hmm. He's doing what he always does. He works everything together for good. Right. And the separation of the waters from the waters is interesting because it was believed in the ancient world that there were two sources of waters, the the, the deeps, um, the, the sources of the water on the earth, but then also the, the ocean above, as it were, the, mm-hmm. the water in the heavens. There's a reference in one of the Psalms to um, deep calling to deep. Yes. And in Canaanite cosmology, it was believed that their creator God, El, lived at the uh, the place of the... Uh, the double deep or the double deeps, uh, which points to Mount Hermon because it was believed there uh, that, uh, you know, the mountain's 9,200 feet mm-hmm. and often the top's, you know, covered in clouds. It so was covered the, in snow when we were there. Yeah, it was, yes, in May, still had snow on the mountain. Even often though it was 110 degrees, right. Mount Hermon was covered with snow. That probably won't melt until August based on historical observation. So the uh, the heavenly waters... And the earthly waters, because the source of the Jordan River used to emerge from Panias, the Grotto of Pan, at the base of Mount Hermon. That's believed to be the double deeps right there. The earthly waters and the heavenly waters mm-hmm. meeting there at Mount Hermon. Um, so, but, when, yeah, when, when deep calls to deep, I'm not sure that's something that we... I, I know that there are some folks out there who look at that and say, oh, that, that really speaks to me on a spiritual level. I, I think that's a reference to what the pagans believed to yeah. be the uh, Mount of Assembly of their creator God. I think you're probably right. And we see the same picture when the flood happens later, that it rains from a heavenly uh, source, and then the fountains the, so of the, the deep, deep open, open up. up. Exactly right. Exactly right. So Genesis 1, verse 7, you're right, we're not going to get out of chapter 1 today. We're not. And God made the expanse and separated the waters that were under the expanse from the waters that were above the expanse, and it was so. So just as we said, separation. Yeah, again, it, you know, what, Moses wrote this during a time when, frankly, many of his, uh, his, his readers, mm-hmm. <laughs> if you want to put it that way, his audience would have had a context that understood, well, these, these are the stories that we heard told in Egypt. These are the stories right. that we heard told, you know, that, that go back to the old, old days, the origins of the earth. Mm-hmm. Moses, again, he is telling, here, there's, forget fake news, yeah. here's the real version of right. it. Right, and they, they probably would be real, very mm-hmm. familiar with the, uh, the Amorite religion of the cultures around them because uh, for two reasons. First of all, they were kind of separated there in Goshen. We don't want you mixing with us, you know, Egyptians. Mm-hmm. Even though Northern Egypt at the time, the Israelites were there, was under the control of Semitic-speaking people, the mm-hmm. Amorites. Um, so, for, and, they, and they had emigrated to Egypt from an a- area controlled by the Amorites, as we see in the book of Joshua, where he says, you know, choose this day which gods you will serve, either the old gods from the land beyond the river, Mesopotamia, mm-hmm. or the gods of the Amorites in whose land you dwell. Those were the gods that they were familiar with. And uh, As for me and my house. Right. We yes. will serve the Lord. And you and I and the group that was with us, we got to say those very words. On that spot. On that very spot where yeah. Joshua said them. That was so powerful. Another thing I want to mention really quickly that just came to mind is, you know, if, if you're trying to uh, uh, instill within your children and even within yourself a love of reading the Bible, think of it this way. 
there are probably times you've thought, gosh, I wish I understood God better. I just would really like to sit down with him and talk and, and, and be able to answer, ask questions. This is the entire Bible is inspired by the Holy Spirit. The mm-hmm. Holy Spirit wrote all of this. Mm-hmm. This is an autobiography. Right. You've got your chance right, to exactly. sit down and hear him tell you his story, his version of what the fallen realm of, of their fake news. Let me correct this for you. Yes. And the good news is he doesn't sugarcoat anything. Mm -hmm. When he talks about things that uh, um, David did or or Eli did or Eli's sons did or or Saul did um, or or Nathan, or you you can name names just over and over. Some were great. Mm -hmm. Most were really lousy. Mm -hmm. Just like we are. Exactly. We are all... Sinners and fall short of the glory of God. Mm-hmm. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. So sit down with your family and yes. read God's autobiography. Yeah. Get the real story. Yeah. And that's, again, what this is all about, just to show you that if we can do it, anybody can do it. Boy, that's the truth. Because yeah. so, the tools are out there. Right. And in fact, we'll put some links in the uh, at the website, gilberthouse.org, sources that we recommend. Um, I like this one. I like Bible Hub. Yeah, um, Bible Hub is great. Bible Gateway is good. Um, As a study Bible, the free Faith Life Study Bible, which is available online, is, is incredible. great. incredible. And once Especially, again, you get... Yes. Michael Heiser. Heiser. Ding, 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 ding. ding, ding. Um, Mike Heiser did the study notes for the book of Genesis. So you get the divine counsel view, especially when you get to Genesis 6. You get that worldview from Dr. Heiser. Right uh, off the Which, bat, yes, right? you don't get from uh, no other study Bible where you get somebody who's saying the Sethite view, not really on the mark. <laughs> Let's look at the other view, which is what was believed by all of the early church fathers, all of the disciples and apostles of Jesus, all of the second temple Jews. Yes. The Nephilim really were the product of angels and humans. So anyway, Genesis one verse eight, and God called the expanse heaven. Again, a reminder, this entity that the Sumerians and the Akkadians are calling Anu, mm-hmm. no, no, Yahweh created him. It, it, the alternate uh, translation there is sky. Mm-hmm. Yep. They called the expanse sky. Right. So. And there was evening and there was morning the second day. Verse 9, And God said, Let the waters under the heavens be gathered together into one place, and let the dry land appear. Okay. So day the two, is, the land finally appears. How did it, it, it uh, appear? Did it, let's, let's look at that word here. Dry land appeared. This is the third day of creation. Sorry. Yeah. Come on, connection. You can do it. Interesting. Um, the first three days of creation, you notice by three acts of separation, God separating light from dark, heaven from earth, and now land from sea. The dry land presented itself. <laughs> Hello. <laughs> Became visible. Appeared. So the question might be, was it underneath all this water? Um, you would assume so. That That's how I always read it, that it, he didn't take a ball of water and just place dry land on it, that the dry land was underneath all of this. Uh-huh. Now, here's the other interesting part of this story. When Noah is um, finishes, he, he's on dry land again, and God gives him the rainbow as a promise saying, I'll never again flood the earth like this. Mm-hmm. Well, you could imply from the way it's put there that there and, and I've read other places where there's a there's a belief that there's more than one worldwide flood. Okay. And that would make sense if we're on the same ball, the same uh, you know third rock from the sun that God created in one one, that went through some ca- a catastrophe during a rebellion, was covered with water, dry land appeared, was made formless and void, and then exactly mm-hmm. that we're on that same creative entity created entity, um, that the dry land would have been there all along. May not have been in the same Mm -hmm. conformation that it currently is. If you think of the various, what we call countries as puzzle Mm -hmm. pieces, Mm -hmm. it may have been put together in an entirely different way Mm -hmm. and then broken apart later on, as they say, and uh, during the days of Peleg, when things were broken up. Pangea split apart, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it's certainly, well, it's obvious when you look at a, a globe 
the globe, that uh, things have moved apart because South America clearly fits into Africa and other you know places. Um, so yeah, you, you're right. It, it may well have been in, in place under the water or we, we don't know. We don't know. All we can do is really speculate. You know, another weird speculation, bunny trail. I see bunnies just <laughs> bouncing all over this room. If you consider, I'm not a, be, a believer in global warming, but the claim is that the sea level is rising. Mm-hmm. Do you think the seas in this end of the age, as the devil realize, starts to realize his time, time is, is short, short and his little minions know that their time is short, that as evil starts to become more manifest, that the sea is trying to take over again? Hmm. That's an interesting Cover thought. up the dry land? It's an interesting thought. I know. It's, it's like yeah. I said, bunny trail, bouncing all over. And, and again, we're not saying that heaven, earth, um, not sky, entities. they are not entities, but there are spirits that manifested themselves to the ancient world and gave them a different story about the actual creation. Okay. Yes. I, I believe that there are entities that have taken control. That's part of the war. Mm-hmm. Prince of the power, prince in the power of the air. Right. And when we get to the Tower of Babel incident, we'll talk about this more. And especially when we get into Deuteronomy 32 and explain the Deuteronomy 32 worldview. Um, God apparently, after Babel, delegated responsibility of the earth to his uh, mm-hmm. to to these watcher class angels who then decided to go rogue mm-hmm. and that's that's what all of history is about god is a punishment to mankind for building the tower said okay you don't want to deal with me you get to deal with my associates mm-hmm. my subordinates mm-hmm. and they like i said set themselves up as gods in their own right and told these other accounts that have come down to us as the enuma elish uh, Greek mythology, the the uh, the Baal cycle, and so on. So we're seeing the spiritual war from the very beginning, the very mm-hmm. first few verses of Genesis. And I think that uh, when the Lord was dictating this through the Holy Spirit to Moses, that uh, the entities that were, you know, the fallen entities that were privy to it, because they were all over Moses' camp, mm-hmm. they knew what was going on. They had to be pretty upset. Well, he's bad mouthing us. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. He's lying on me. No, actually, he's telling the <laughs> truth. You're a liar. Shut exactly. Up. That's why. <laughs> <laughs> so you really have nothing, nothing to say. Um, Go ahead, uh, so where were we at? Verse, uh, verse ten. Yeah, I think we might get up through the creation uh, until we'll the see. creation of mankind. We'll have to stop there. I think this week. That's a good place uh, verse to stop. 10. Actually, yeah. God called the dry land Earth. And the waters that were gathered together, he called seas, and God saw that it was good. And again, earth, Gaia, and then we get into seas, and that's, uh, is that yam? Probably Uh, in the Hebrew. Yes, yamim, multiple seas. Yes, yam. Yeah, yam was uh, in the Ugaritic texts, um, the sea monster, the god of the sea, equated with Poseidon or Mm -hmm. Neptune in the Greek and Roman mythologies. So, you know, again, more entities, more examples of divine Mm -hmm. counsel. Well, yes, exactly. And if nothing else... Or at least you know, a framework for the divine council. Because again, we're not saying that when he created the sea, he created angels that were literally the sea, which is what the Greeks, Romans, Canaanites, Mesopotamians believed. No, but he created a a, a, a liquid environment, we'll put it that way, right. that I believe was uh, stolen and taken from... You know, we're going to claim... It's part of the battlefield. Mm-hmm. We're claiming control of the seas. You know, these these fallen spirits. Right, right. And God said, let the earth sprout vegetation, plants yielding seed, and fruit trees bearing fruit in which is their seed, each according to its kind on the earth. Oh, wait a minute. What about evolution? Yeah. Each according to its kind. Oh, it burns. Yeah. You don't have spore bearing plants like ferns suddenly switching over to seeds and producing trees. No. Yeah. And it was so. The earth brought forth vegetation, plants yielding seed according to their own kinds, and trees bearing fruit in which is their seed, each according to its kind. You know, it's wonderful saw, that, the, that the Lord thought to put that in there long. It's like he knew Darwin was going to show up. <laughs> exactly. Uh, and actually long before Darwin, because uh, some of the Greek naturalist philosophers in uh, before Jesus um, arrived mm-hmm. on Earth were, were speculating. And it proposed a theory very much like Darwinian, mm-hmm. Darwinian evolution. Well, yeah, Lamarck sort of based his uh, ideas on those old Greek mm-hmm. notions. Yeah. Uh, and God saw that it was good. Verse 13. And there was evening and there was morning the third day. So the third day of creation, again, the uh, division of land and earth and then the emergence of plants. 
Verse 14, And God said, Let there be lights in the expanse of the heavens to separate the day from the night, and let them be for signs and for seasons and for days and for years. And, and signs and for indeed. seasons also could be translated appointed times. Well, you know, we, we see this many times, and throughout the Bible you have different folks who see things in the sky, or in fact, you, you uh, it's almost a tradition in the occult mm-hmm. to give... Well, Nostradamus, for instance, Mm -hmm. he would say, you know, such and such is here, this is Scorpio is here, the moon is in such and such. He was trying to give you a time frame as to when something would happen. I think we see similar things in the Bible. We, you know, we're we're told that the moon turns to blood, that the sun stops to give her, that the stars start to fall. Mm -hmm. That's going to be a pretty clear sign that something big is about to happen. But it also, I believe, gets into this idea, and again, it's the fallen realm interpreting. Mm -hmm. There is a a really wonderful study by, uh, oh gosh, starts with a B, um, that the the Maseroth, the heavens, the... uh, Oh, oh, um, mm, 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 uh, not D. James Kennedy. No, no. Well, he based it on the the study and uh, and starts with a B, and forgive me, I'll think of it later. But taking a look at the gospel and stars. Mm Mm-hmm. And the idea that all of the historic constellations, because uh, civilizations have seen essentially the same pictures in the heavens for millennia, that those tell the gospel. Bullinger. Bullinger and also Joseph Seiss, S-E-I-S-S, 19th century uh, Lutheran pastor also. uh, But you're right, you're right, Uh, E.W. Bullinger. Yeah. We do not say and never have said that you can look at the stars, the constellations, and determine your fate. No, absolutely Based on not. when you were born right. or what's going to happen that day or what's... The, no, but I believe that they are there to tell us a story. Mm-hmm. And they also, be, depending upon what happens in them, will help to foretell a story, show us signs. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And of course, they do tell us the seasons, let's face it. Right. And it also marked the times of the, uh, the feasts and festivals that God gave to Moses. Yes. Absolutely. So what we see up there is really important. Mm -hmm. So another thing, you know, you want an assignment for your family, take the kids out, go somewhere out in the country where you don't have a whole lot of light pollution and just camp out and look at the stars. It it makes you humble. It really does. You see how big creation really is out there. Uh, And you can see the Milky Way. Surprisingly enough. Yeah. Yeah. Saw it. it, I probably saw it when I was a kid. You know, we used to go camping with scouts a lot, but I was too busy just goofing around with other guys to really pay attention. But yeah, when we came here one night, I let Sam outside at night, didn't have my glasses on. I looked up and said, oh, that was kind of cloudy out there. Wait a minute. Clouds wouldn't glow like that. Oh, (laughs) even without my glasses on, my nearsighted eyes can make out there's a Milky Way up there. That's incredible. Mm -hmm. So What, uh, What I find most interesting about the Milky Way is it does look like the Ouroboros. Mm-hmm. You yeah, see that yeah. snake eating its tail imagery. Mm-hmm. So um, let's see. Uh, let them be for si- signs and for seasons and for days and for years. Let them be lights in the expanse of the heavens to give light upon the earth. And it was so. And God made the two great lights, the greater light to rule the day and the lesser light to rule the night and the stars. Okay, got to stop you there. We may not get any farther than this because honestly, this verse, considering everything that you've been studying and writing about, is very interesting. What the Lord is saying here is, Moon, you're the lesser light. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Right, right, yes. right, right. I Boy, I hadn't even thought about that. Because oh, yes, in Mesopotamia, He smacks the moon, down the moon over and over and over again in the right, Old Testament. Right, right. Moon is um, is Yarik in, in uh, Hebrew, which is the uh, the word behind the name of uh, the city of Jericho. Uh, you remember, we translate from Hebrew to English, the Y becomes a J. And, mm-hmm. Anyway, Um but it was because the moon was venerated, was probably one of, if not the most important god to the Amorites, especially the Amorites who founded Babylon. And that's significant because Moses was writing at a time when, although the Amorite dynasty that founded Babylon was no longer around, they were knocked off in 1595 BC by the by the, the Hittites, came all the way from Turkey mm-hmm. to Babylon and sacked the city. But then they went back to Turkey, Anatolia, and a tribal people from the mountains of Iran called the Kashites came in and took over. So for and actually, they, actually these Kashites ruled Babylon longer than any other 
ruling dynasty, longer than the Chaldeans of Nebuchadnezzar's mm-hmm. day, longer than the Amorites of Hammurabi's day. The Kashites ruled, and they changed the name of the city. They didn't even call it Babylon anymore. It was called Karduniish. Mm-hmm. We don't. We were never taught that. But anyway, Trump uh, Heights. Ex- yeah, Trump Heights. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, the point, though, is that they, the uh, moon god inspired the Amorites who founded Babylon to create... Actually, they would have said, we hate Trump heights. <laughs> yeah, but more than likely. Yeah, more than likely. Uh, and they'd have flown a little balloon over it. Uh, anyway, they created the, the, uh, the, the occult system that uh, became symbolic or emblematic of B- Babylon, which then John the Revelator used as the emblem of the, uh, the symbol of the end times Church of the Antichrist. They did, but... So what? The, the point is that they were worshippers primarily of the moon god. In fact, the last king of Babylon, Nabonidus, was a moon god worshiper. The moon was really, really important back in the day, and God says, no, no, you are the lesser light. The lesser light. This comes at a time Moses took his people through the Sinai Desert, the, the wilderness, wilderness of sin. sin. The moon he, god. He was on the Mount Sinai, Sinai, the mm-hmm. mountain of the moon. Over and over again, right. the Lord is just saying, moon, you know what? Stop trying it. You're, you're not it. You're yes. not all that. In fact, I made you. Remember that? Exactly. And that's why Jericho was the first city attacked on the west side of the Jordan River. Yes. Um, Smacking the moon down. Yeah. And we'll talk about this when we get into the Exodus. But, uh, you know, this was after they went and attacked Og of Bashan and the Golan Heights. They had to turn around and march all the way back down the Jordan River, which, you know, when you're doing that with a couple million people, that's a big undertaking. They could have crossed over there, but they didn't. They went back down so they could hit Jericho first. Mm-hmm. Anyway. Now, at the time, you know, that this is, this is when he created all of these things. And when he created them, we see over and over again, they were good mm-hmm. when he creates these lights in the heavens. So at some point, the fallen realm took control and, well, fake news. Right, right. <laughs> I am the moon. I am the one who controls Mm -hmm. the movements of the moon. I'm the one who shines down upon you at night in the desert and gives you light so that you can, you know, do this or that. I am the, I am the sun. I am the one who is great. I'm the one who makes your plants to grow. And and the key of the sun with the sun is that the sun was believed by the ancient Mesopotamians, the Amorites and the Sumerians to be the great lawgiver. Mm -hmm. The the pillar of uh, Hammurabi, where his law code is inscribed, shows an inscription on top of the sun god Shamash giving the law to Hammurabi. Mm Mm-hmm. And there are still cities in uh, Israel today and ancient uh, sites, and hopefully we can see this one next year, that are, uh, the, the, uh, it's, it's near the, the Valley of Elah, it's southwest of Hebron, called Beth Shemesh, which means house. Oh, yes, yes, that's house, on our list. Yeah, house or temple of the sun god. So um, that was an aspect of r- the religion of the ancient Mesopotamian world. Shemesh, or Shemesh in Hebrew, was the not, not only the lawgiver, but the one who every night went down below the horizon to judge mm-hmm. In the underworld. the underworld, so you could say that he uh, was Lord of the Dead. In a sense, in, in a, a sense. sense. Yeah, Baal was or considered judging. Lord of the That's Dead. That's right, judging. That's true, but he was judging the Judging the underworld. The underworld. So, but again, God, Yahweh, saying, no, no, I created you, and then later, then he gives the law to Moses. Yes, exactly. Right. You're, the son is not the lawgiver, I am. Right, right. Boy, there's a lot in here. We're going to make it through 19, and that's it. Yeah, so the first, the first four days of creation. <laughs> Verse 17, God set them in the expanse of the heavens to give light on the earth, to rule over the day and over the night, and to separate the light from the darkness. And God saw that it was good. And there was evening, and there was morning the fourth day. Mm. Yeah, okay. So the first three chapters of Genesis was really <laughs> ambitious. Boy, what were we thinking? Yeah. Well, we, we learned a bit since last time. We have, you know, and, and, and this is why, honestly, I'm excited for five, six years hence. Let's say it's six, considering we'll probably go more slowly this time. Right. That will bring even more to the table. Mm-hmm. And the other aspect of this is that having been all the way through the Bible now, uh, we can see where all of these things that are seated here in Genesis chapter one have other uh, implications later through scripture, how these, you know, th- this foundation uh, sets up the rest of the Bible. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And if you do not read Genesis, and there are an awful lot of people who simply do, well, it's boring. And you besides, it's all under- myth. Yeah. yeah. You no, won't no. understand anything mm-hmm. if you don't read Genesis, and you have to read Genesis with a supernatural worldview in mind. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And w- honestly, when Derek and I, and it will probably be in July that we start producing our uh, Skywatch TV show, Unraveling Revelation, mm-hmm. we'll probably start with Genesis. 
Yeah. If you don't get Genesis, you won't understand anything in Revelation. Right, because without the foundation, again, there's no nothing to put the roof on, nothing to build mm-hmm. the rest of the house. And yeah. Revelation is the culmination of all of this. God created it. His creation, both in the angelic realm and humanity, rebelled. He created us all with free will, and we chose to disobey. We chose evil over good. And Revelation is where he punishes those who have not repented and then establishes a new heaven and a new earth for the rest of us who have accepted Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. Wow. So, yeah, without the one, you can't have the other because then neither makes sense. And that's why so many churches don't teach Genesis or Revelation Mm -hmm. because they don't believe in Genesis and so Revelation doesn't Mm -hmm. make any sense. And besides, it's weird and scary. and And all the other stuff, they're life lessons. Yeah, yeah. And in fact, I don't even, you know, there, there's some pastors that just ignore the Bible altogether and just tell personal stories. <laughs> yeah. I and, won't name names. And that's how you get to be a New York Times best-selling author. <laughs> well, uh, and, and, you know, God bless them, because anybody who, who preaches the gospel, even if they're doing it for personal the gain. wrong reasons, for personal gain, right, that those lessons you can touch people. God can use that. The Holy Spirit can use that and mm-hmm. just pray. And we'll do this in just a moment, um, to, you know, for his own purposes. Yes. Um, yes. And God will deal with them. The, you know, the epistle of James says that any of us who have the gumption to teach mm-hmm. have an extra level of accountability because we will be responsible for what we, which is why, as we said before, we don't do this live. Um, <laughs> Um, he still hears what we say long. That's true. But he, I think he understands the fact that we try to correct it before it goes right, out there. Right. Um, so there is a special level of accountability, and uh, God will, there there will be a reckoning for all of us one day. Um, so uh, just understand that if somebody's preaching for the wrong reasons, okay, God's going to deal with them either sooner or later, but eventually, yes, God will he'll deal with us all someday. Exactly. And, so, and even if someone is preaching you know, the wrong um, uh, inter- interpretation. If God's word is read from that pulpit mm-hmm. ever, his word never returns void. Right. Never. God will always be able to use his word regardless of the context. Absolutely. So, Lord, we, we thank you for bringing us together for this opportunity to hear your word and to better understand the foundation of your plan for our salvation. Because we know from the beginning, Father, that uh, we, your creation, humanity, have rebelled against your authority. And as John wrote, if we say we are sinless, we're lying. None are righteous. We have all fallen short of your glory, your perfection. And we pray, Father, for your forgiveness. And Lord, we just ask if there are any listening now, who have not made that decision to accept Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, as God among us. Pray that your Spirit would work in their hearts, Father, to bring them to you. Lord, we pray for the salvation of any who have not yet made that decision, knowing that, Lord, you are like, you are the Father in the parable of the, the, the Son who is lost. And returns and is welcomed back, even covered with pig slop and 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 reeking of having rolled in the uh, in the waste of an of the unclean animals who were not fit for consumption in uh, among your people. We are the prodigal son, the prodigal child, the prodigal children returning to you, grateful for your love and for your forgiveness. So we pray, Father, as we begin this new cycle of study of your word, that you will help us to more to understand more fully your love and forgiveness for us. And then to share that love, reflect it to those around us, so that we would help draw people, that your spirit can use us to draw people to you, that we would not make ourselves stumbling blocks between those who are still struggling to find their way in the gospel of Jesus Christ. We pray for those missionaries in the foreign fields, Lord, especially those in lands where preaching the gospel 
is a threat to their own lives. We pray for the church in China. We pray for the Christians struggling to remain alive in, and survive in Iraq and in Syria and in the Middle East. We pray for those, Father, who are tempted by the promise of earthly rewards in the rest of the world to reject the rewards here and now in favor of storing up treasures in heaven. And we pray that for ourselves, Lord. We ask all these things and your blessing in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. By the way, you uh, will have uh, a best of VFTB tonight. Who's it with? Tonight, um, and it's kind of interesting that I, I planned this out because it, it turned yeah. out to be more timely than Maybe I, the I Lord meant. the Lord planned it out. Yes, well, exactly right. Um, interviews with scholars of Islamic history. Mm. Uh, Dr. Timothy Furnish, who has got a PhD in Islamic eschatology, and he's been very helpful in helping me to understand the difference between Sunni Islam and Shia Islam, and especially what they believe about the end times. And uh, then Raymond Ibrahim, who's got a recent book out called Sword and Scimitar. And that's very timely because Raymond, in January, was invited to speak at the U.S. Army War College in Carlisle, Pennsylvania. And two weeks ago, it came to the attention of the Council of American Islamic Relations and uh, shrill Muslim activist Linda Sarsour of her group called Empower something. And they began applying pressure to the U.S. Army War College, saying that um, Raymond, who is uh, an Arab American, he's, uh, his parents are from Egypt, he's a Coptic Christian, mm-hmm. he's a racist, he's a white nationalist, according to them. <sighs> How can an Arab be a white nationalist? <laughs> and sadly, the Army War College backed down and they have disinvited Raymond from speaking. He was scheduled to speak this coming Wednesday, the 19th. And uh, mm. that uh, quote unquote has been postponed, end quote. But it's not, um, <clears throat> that's just kind of the weasel way of saying we're, yeah. not, we're not inviting him. Um, so anyway, as a result, however, sales of his book at Amazon have spiked. And so... Uh, See, there's an upside. There is an upside. He's also got now some meetings scheduled with uh, members of the United States Congress who want to find out how this could possibly be that the men training our war fighters are so afraid of being called bigots that they won't hear a historian talking about documented history. His book is 352 pages. It is heavily footnoted from original sources, many of them Muslim sources Mm -hmm. from the Middle Ages that he translated. So um, it's not like he's making stuff up. So anyway, Mm -hmm. that'll be tonight on A View from the Bunker. It'll be a good two hours because between him and Tim Furnish and their friends, uh, and Tim has his own stories about being Mm -hmm. disinvited from speaking to um, our soldiers. He had been a consultant for Special Operations uh, Command. Um, Yeah, it's it's, going to be informative. And again, I highly recommend it. Both of, well, all of their books, both uh, uh, Tim and, and Raymond, both uh, very, very informative. And when you read the actual history of the 14 centuries of relations between the Islamic world and Christendom, your eyes will be opened because mm. this history is being hidden from us in the 21st century in the well, West. It, you don't want to miss that. That'll be tonight, 7 p.m. Mm-hmm. And uh, there are places you can go. You can go to vftb.net and lots of other spots to get it. You're on Spreaker and and. I don't know. Spreaker, I Stitcher, iHeartRadio. Just, just as we are. We're, we're also at Spotify. And yeah. we, we hear at gilberthouse.org where you can click a link on the on the sidebar and subscribe so that these uh, studies automatically download to your smartphone or tablet or, or iPod or whatever. Yeah, in a way, in a very real way, gilberthouse.org is sort of our hub. Mm-hmm. We have links there to just about everything we do. Um, also, speaking of things we do, we just can't, got invited to go back down to Blue Eye. We're going to be on oh, the yeah. Jim Baker Show recording... Uh, programs Tuesday the 18th of June. Um, if you're in the Branson or Blue Eye area, I highly recommend you stop by and say hello because we just, we love meeting you you lovely folks. And um, I'm not sure if we're going to be on Grace Street or at the chapel. We, we have heard rumors that it may be in the chapel, but the best thing to do is go to Grace Street, which is the main mm-hmm. building with the bookstore and the, the, you know, the normal TV studio, all the chairs and, and all of that are. But uh, um, if you don't see... Uh, 
us up on the podium or ask you for know, directions. lots of folks uh, setting up cameras, ask for directions. Yeah. That's what we intend to do. <laughs> the taping should begin at uh, 11, no, at, at noon, at noon. Yeah. But if you get there around 11, that'll be plenty of time for you to get a good seat, whether it's there on Gray Street or up at the chapel. Yeah, and you can get a nice lunch in the cafe. Boy, oh, they get good yeah. food. Oh, they do. They do. So that'll be a lot of fun. We've got, uh, boy... Check the events calendar at uh, gilberthouse.org because we've got more conferences that we're speaking at this year. I uh, just got invited to another one in California in mm-hmm. September. Yes, yeah, so it's getting crazy probably, busy, which yeah. is really, really, really good. Uh, so, you know, support us in that because we, yeah. we're, we're doing our best to, to share the love, so to speak. And, and as Derek said earlier, Gilbert, Gilbert House Fellowship is not intended to be a substitute for church because you do need to physically be in the same room with fellow believers mm-hmm. at least once in a while. And these conferences are a really good way to do that. Yeah, yeah. Uh, it, getting together with other people who get it, mm-hmm. who understand that there's more in the Bible than many churches are, are putting out there. Not not all. I mean, there's still some really good churches out there, and hopefully this... Uh, uh, that, but uh, again, hopefully this can act as a supplement and uh, just maybe pull a few more nuggets out of there that just remind us of how amazing our creator is and the depth of his love for us, that he has gone to all of this trouble to restore us to the family. He's just waiting for us prodigal kids to make our way home. I think that's the perfect way to end. Until next time, I'm Derek Gilbert. I'm Sharon Gilbert. Bye-bye, everybody. Thank you for joining us. We post a new Bible study each Sunday morning. Subscribe to the podcast and explore the archives online at gilberthouse.org.